It's really to help you with the exam. Uh, the last one, you're going to have one more problem set. Uh, it is a study guide, actually, for hormones. It's a hormone worksheet. It's going to help you organize all the hormones you're going to learn next week, and you can also just upload that one as well. That'll be due on Friday as well. Okay, we are recording at this point. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this down. And the correct response is CCK. How'd you all do? Yes, doing very well. 93% of you got that one right. Now, on the exam, I had a great question in my office. Um, a lot of students were asking me what the format of was exam four. I'm just letting you know that it's a little bit, there's less application type problems and more just over the plate, right? So if you make flashcards and you know this uh, material, there's no calculations for exam four. And it's just pretty much straightforward, okay? Straightforward information. But you do need to know the information. You need to know what S cells and I cells and G cells are, okay? So, um, all right, so how are we doing? 35 people, S cells, release the hormone. <coughs> all right, kind of slow to respond on this one. Now, as we're, I'm waiting for the answers here, just a, a, some, a little bit more information about your case study. Notice that the answer boxes are very small, all right? I just want very short answers. I don't want a senior thesis for each question, okay? So just make sure they're very short answers for this particular last case study. All right, we're up to 78, 79. I'm going to give you about five more seconds. All right, and the correct answer, of course, is secretin. Nice. 87% of you all got that right. And this is the last one. CCK has effects on gallbladder, sphincter of OD, pancreas, or all of the above. So you know definitively, well, I better wait. <laughs> I want to give you the answer. <laughs> All right, we're up to 70. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Kind of lightning rounds here. All right, we got the most people answering this one. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it, close it out. And the correct answer is D, all of the above. So um, you, I'm sure, knew that, the C, that CCK actually does have effects on the pancreas. It signals the pancreas to release lipase. You already know, too, from previous lectures that it does have effects on the gallbladder. It does actually contract the gallbladder to release bile to help emulsify fats. So you can see it's a very elegant system. Eye cells detect the fats. It releases CCK. CCK is a hormone that's delivered into the blood and travels to the pancreas and the gallbladder to release lipase and bile to help emulsify and um, degrade, break down those fats into smaller fat droplets. You didn't know, however, that CCK also has effects on the sphincter of OD. It helps to relax the sphincter of OD so that it delivers those uh, enzymes, lipases, and bile. Okay, so the correct answer, you all deduced, which is wonderful. 97% got that right. It's all of the above. All right, so that's it for the top hat questions. We're going to go ahead and start with the lecture um, let's see here. We are going to be talking about the small intestines and the large intestines and the defecation response. So it's called digestion, absorption, and defecation. All right, so um, 
We're first going to start off in the small intestines. Uh, the main thing that I'm going to be talking to, about today is motility. I'm going to talk about different types of motility in the small intestines and large intestines. So it's really important. I'll point that out. And then um, we're going to be talking about how different molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are broken down and absorbed. Okay, we'll talk about some transport properties. As I said before, I wanted to go back and make sure that you had this information. Uh, remember GIP, which is what I always remember, but and on the exam, I will always put the name of the, um, the uh, molecule and its acronym so that you know it. Okay, so a lot of uh, journal articles will refer to it as gastric inhibitory peptide or gastric inhibitory polypeptide. Um, but most scientists, the newer name is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. Okay, so that actually gives you some information about its function. Remember that GIP is uh, basically these GIP secreting cells are detecting glucose, carbohydrates. Uh, once carbohydrates are detected, it sends a signal to the pancreas to actually start to release insulin. Okay, so that's a really important part. Also, secretin, CCK, and GIP all feed back to the stomach to decrease gastric emptying. That seems a little counterintuitive, but it's not about dumping all of that food into the small intestines. It's actually about piecemealing it little by little. Yes, question, please. Uh, this is on the website. It's after, uh, is it not on the website? It's 37. 37. I don't know what the title is, actually. Oh, because I just added that one this morning. I just added these two this morning because I wanted to go back and, and talk about uh, that end of the, the um, lecture last time. So this is where we pick up. This is the slides that you probably have. So sorry about the confusion there. I just added those this morning so we could talk about that. All right. Just remember again that these molecules feed back to the stomach to actually decrease gastric emptying. All right. So here's where we're going to pick up. Anatomy, motility, digestion, and absorption. Uh, let's start off with the layers of the small intestines. Uh, these layers are divided into mucosa. This layer actually faces the lumen or the inside of the tube, the inside of the small intestines. And it has epithelial cells that line it. Remember, these are the barriers between the outside world and the inside of your body. Uh, there are different types of cells, exocrine and endocrine cells, and uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute, mucus secreting cells as well. The next layer called the submucosa actually is where all the blood vessels and lymph vessels are. <laughs> now we're going to learn that fat is actually delivered, or uh, chylomicrons, which is a, a form of fat, is actually delivered into the lymph system. Okay. Uh, but you can see that these, the lymph and the blood supply is very closely associ uh, associated with the mucosa because all of those nutrients are going to be delivered into the blood supply and the lymph vessels. Okay, so those nutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, amino acids, I should say. All right, the next layer under that is the circular and longitudinal muscle. This actually houses the myenteric nerve plexus, and when we talk about things like peristalsis and motility in the gut, this is where uh, I want you to focus on the muscularis externa layer. And then the serosal layer is uh, basically at uh, facing the outside, the peritoneum. Okay, so the gut wall has a layered organization with absorptive cells lining the lumen and neural and muscular components below. Blood and lymph is abundant to transport absorbed nutrients. Okay, so uh, also what's important to note is that your gut, your small intestines and large intestines are one of the most innervated organs in your body. It actually has, sorry, 
Yeah, Beatles. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Any questions about this so far, about the layers of the gut? If we zoom in a little bit more, we just talked about those four main la layers. I want to focus in on some of the specific names for the cells that line the lumen, those epithelial cells. The mucosa cells are made up of enterocytes. These are the absorptive cells within the microvilli. So what are the microvilli? I'll come back to this in just a second. This slide actually kind of uh, gives you better information. You can see it a little bit better. You can see that there's these undulations, these folds within the small intestines. These larger folds are called villus. It's villi is plural. And then within each of the villus, each villus actually has more undulations called microvilli. And this is also known as brush border. So you can already see that in addition to the small intestines and the large intestines being very long, long, long tubes, there's all of these multiple folds that help to increase surface area to maximize absorption of nutrients. Okay, so that's what the microvilli are. So the enterocytes are the absorptive cells with microvilli. Goblet cells secrete mucus. Now we had that, one of, that was one of our foils on the top hat question today. Goblet cells are actually within the small intestines and they secrete mucus. And then enteroendocrine-like cells secrete hormones, like the I cells, the S cells. And then panith cells, another name to learn, secrete antimicrobial molecules to knock down certain bacterial load. Okay, So you already have these antimicrobial properties within the gut. Okay, again, just one more time, just remember that all of these undulations or folds are helping to increase surface area. Even the microvilli help to further increase surface area. All right, so a little pathophysiology, just wanna let you know that uh, if there is some disorder, uh, let's just say that you're not able to secrete enough bicarbonate to reduce the acid load in the duodenum, sometimes what happens is that acid actually gets within the layer uh, of the intestines and then will start to degrade the mucosal level, the mucosal uh, layer, and then it can actually start to eat away all the way to this visible blood vessel, okay? So this is known as an ulcer. This is a duodenal ulcer. Ulcer, and the way that you have to kind of uh, diagnose this is through endoscopy. You uh, they thread a camera down your throat basically into your duodenum, and then you can base they can basically see that ulcer and give you medication once it's diagnosed. So this procedure greatly enhances our understanding of normal processes in the gut and reveals complications resulting in disease. Okay, so let me just take a step back and then make sure that you understand the protective mechanisms within both the stomach and the intestines here. The mu mucins that are secreted actually help to um, keep the bicarbonate trapped between the mucosal, the uh, mucin layer and the layer of the epithelial cells. So if any acid gets through that mucus layer, it's going to encounter a pretty high concentration of bicarbonate. That helps to protect the layer. And again, if there's any kind of disorder, maybe there's uh, with cystic fibrosis, for instance, if you can't deliver that bicarbonate into the intestines, then you don't have any way to neutralize that acid and ulcers can start to appear. So again, even with cystic fibrosis, even the mildest forms of cystic fibrosis can lead to digestive issues, okay? All right, um, okay, so keep moving on. Um, I just wanna talk about, again, that surface area. Nutrients are hydrolyzed in the lumen. They're broken down in the lumen of the GI tract. 
uptake of the end products is slow, but efficiency of uptake is improved by increasing the surface area. You also are increasing the gut length, like I mentioned before, and those undulations, which are the folds. All of that increases uh, surface area. All right, so this is kind of the heart of what I want you to absorb here too, no pun intended. <laughs> um, okay, so when we're talking about optimal speed, uh, there's a lot that goes on with this, and it's mainly driven by those neurons, those nerve plexuses that I was talking about. This is really uh, important with motility. The movement of flu, flu ugh, the movement of food through the GI tract has to be fast enough to minimize the amount of indigestible material. So basically, you're trying to move through the tube and digest enough of material to really minimize how much is going to end up in your feces, right? But it has to be slow enough to allow time for digestion and absorption, okay? So there's this optimal speed. Another way to think about this, too, we're going to be talking about diarrhea in just a second, too. <laughs> Fun stuff. But if it's actually, if there's an issue where food is moving too fast through the system, uh, it can cause, you don't get enough of a breakdown and absorption, and they act as osmolites, pulling water into the tube and causing diarrhea. This is what happens with lactose intolerance. Okay? So we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Again, there's an optimal speed here. Now, there's three types. I'm just going to take a step back and, and make sure that you all kind of absorb this. Again, not, no pun intended. Uh, there's three types of motility that I want you to understand in the small intestines. One is segmentation. The other is peristalsis. And the third, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, is migrating myoelectric complex. These are three types of motility in the small intestines. So let's first start off with segmentation. Segmentation is interesting. Um, basically what you're looking at here is the small intestines, what happens with time. This is the same tube, but this is what happens from one period of time to the next period of time. So I'm going to walk over here because this is a very static kind of uh, diagram. But what's happening in the small intestines with segmentation is one segment is actually going to be um, relaxed and the other one is going to be uh, contracted, okay? So what happens is over time they switch back and forth just like this. This is what's called segmentation. And that's what this diagram is actually depicting. Okay, so one segment is relaxed where well, the segment right next to it is contracted, and then this one relaxes and this one contracts. So it's a type of motility that helps with mixing, mixing. So I'm going to go to this next one and go back to peristalsis. You can see here this is the tube, and now they've broken down each of the segments with a dash. This is time going down. So with this segment right here, it contracts, relax, it relaxes, and then contracts again. Here it's relaxing, contracts, and relaxing. So it just, over time, it's switching back and forth. And what you notice is these two wads or bolus of food, they, it tends to mix them together. Okay, it's a way to mix that food together to help break it down. Eventually, it's going to get into smaller and smaller pieces, and then it'll be broken down by some of those enzymes. So this is known as segmentation. Mixing and churning action. It's portrayed here as segmentation contractions. Now, peristalsis is different. Remember my sweatpants analogy, right? Peristalsis is actually um, a coordinated effort between longitudinal and circular smooth muscle. And it's coordinated by that electrical matrix, that myenteric plexus, that allows the individual cells to contract as a unit. Okay? 
So uh, what you have is the circular smooth muscle contracting behind a bolus of food and the longitudinal muscle kind of moving it down the line. So peristalsis is a slow wave of contraction that moves food down the GI tract. Now, a little bit more information about it. It's actually controlled not only by the my, uh, myogenic activity. Myogenic means muscle. The intrinsic activity is coming from the smooth muscle itself, but also these interstitial cells of Cajal. And these actually act as pacemaker cells. In fact, they have the same HCN channels that we talked about with the SA node in the heart. They have those funny channels. And so that gives a rhythmic contraction to this peristalsis interstitial cells of Cajal. So the resting muscle tone controls the lumen diameter and is regulated by that uh, intrinsic pathway, those myogenic uh, pacemaker cells. And how does that work? I'm going to go into a little bit more depth. You can actually see here, remember the pacemaker channels, those HCN channels, they provide these cells with an eroding depolarization. So it doesn't have a stable resting membrane potential. There's an eroding depolarization until it reaches threshold, and then it activates not sodium channels, but calcium channels. And these are known as calcium spikes. Okay, so when that happens, calcium Spikes, you can see that contraction occurs. The more calcium spikes you have, the greater the contraction of that smooth muscle. So again, it's a rhythmic, it's an intrinsic, myogenic uh, capability that provides this rhythmic waves in smooth muscle contraction. All right, any questions about that? It's pretty cool. It kind of brings back with some of the things from exam one, two. So again, like I said, it always, all of this material kind of builds upon itself. All right, um, here we go. This is the last one, migrating myoelectric complex. And this is really interesting. This occurs after you've eaten a meal, uh, probably about an hour or two after you eat a meal. This migrating myoelectric complex lasts about 90 minutes. And it starts, so this is in time. You can actually see it's kind of an x-axis is time. The uh, contractions start, the motor activity starts in the stomach, and then it sweeps through the duodenum. Middle part of the intestines is the jejunum and the ileum here. And you can see the motor activity just sweeps through the small intestines making sure that you deliver that last bit of food that may be left in the tube into the colon. Migrating myoelectric complex. All right, so uh, let's move on to digestion. Talk a little bit more about digestion here. We actually just want to review. This was part of our top hat questions too. Remember that the pancreas and sphincter of Odi and gallbladder are all within this J loop within the duodenum. And um, basically what you have here is they have a common sphincter here that allows for both pancreatic enzymes and bile to be delivered from the gallbladder uh, when CCK is circulating through uh, your body. So let's talk about each of the different enzymes, each of these different molecules that are going to be uh, broken down within the small intestines. Uh, these are the digestive enzymes that are coming from the pancreas. Okay, so let's first start off with proteases and how uh, proteins are broken down. Uh, I just want you to remember here that proteins start to break down in the stomach. Remember the chief cells are secreting pepsinogen. And the parietal cells, when they secrete acid, that converts pepsinogen, the inactive form, to pepsin. So you already have an enzyme in the stomach that's starting to break down proteins. All right? But some of the food that enters into the um, 
small intestine is further broken down by these proteases. Here's a good example. Uh, the pancreas actually does secrete an enzyme called trypsinogen. Okay, trypsinogen, and there's a few more that I'll also throw out here, but I'm going to use trypsinogen right now to just show you how this is um, delivered. It's delivered into the small intestines, right? This is the intestinal lumen um, in an inactive form. Because if it's in its active form, it may start to break down the epithelial cells that line the small intestines. So uh, it's delivered as trypsinogen. Then you have these membrane-bound enterokinases, these enzymes that then convert it to trypsin. And then trypsin is the active form. There's other enzymes. I'm going to talk about chymotrypsin in just a minute where you now activate enzymes that can break down proteins. Okay, so once uh, trypsin is activated and it activates other uh, enzymes that break down proteins, what happens is you actually hear is what I just talked about. Remember, pepsin is already starting to break down proteins to large polypeptides in the stomach. Then these large polypeptides are further broken down by trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. Anytime you see ACE at the end, you can just assume that it's an enzyme. And when you see peptid, this peptides, you can just assume, again, these are uh, referring to proteins that are being broken down into amino acids, peptides, and then smaller amino acids. Okay? So, the thing to remember from this slide is just be able to recognize trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase, and know that these are enzymes that break down proteins into smaller peptides and amino acids. So let's take a look at the transport properties. Once uh, proteins have been broken down into small peptides and amino acids, you can see that there's transport mechanisms that transport these um, molecules into the epithelial cells that line the small intestines. And then there are transporters that, this is facilitated diffusion, that then transport it with its concentration gradient into the blood. Okay, so notice that these transporters on the apical <coughs> membrane are secondary active transporters. They're actually active transporters that are using either the proton gradient or the sodium gradient to move these molecules against their concentration gradient. That's how you're able to absorb small peptides and amino acids into your blood. Any questions about this transport? You've seen these transporters before. You know something about secondary active transporters. So I want to just make sure I bring that back and you can see how absorption occurs within the intestines. All right, amylases. We've already talked about salivary amylase, right? You can actually see here, here's another kind of diagram showing you that first, uh, even when food is just in your mouth, you have amylase that is actually being delivered by the parotid gland. The parotid gland is already secreting salivary amylase to start breaking down um, carbohydrates into oligosaccharides. And then nothing in the stomach, but then once that food is delivered into the small intestines, you have pancreatic amylase that's actually further breaking these down into disaccharides and monosaccharides. Okay, so this is a list here. You don't need to memorize this, okay? But this gives you a good idea of some of the carbohydrates in food. Some of the polysaccharides include starch, cellulose, glycogen. Now, cellulose is a molecule that cannot be broken down by us, right? Um, Cows can do that. They actually have a rumen that has a lot of bacteria in it that 
gives them the capability of breaking down cellulose, but for us, we're, we don't have the enzymes to break that down. Uh, we do have the enzymes to break down other molecules, uh, sucrose, lactose, maltose, into monosaccharides, which includes glucose, fructose, and galactose. Now, some people are lactose intolerant. That's because they don't have lactase, right? What happens then is that lactose, when it can't be broken down, as I mentioned before, it acts as an osmolite inside the small intestines, which draws in water and causes diarrhea, okay? Um, all right, so here's what happens. Here's the uh, transport properties. Again, no surprise. We actually have these secondary active transporters that are using the sodium gradient to move either glucose or galactose into the cell against its concentration gradient, okay? And it's mainly these monosaccharides that can be absorbed into the cells. And then these facilitated diffusion transporters that allow for fructose, glucose, and galactose to move across the basal lateral membrane with its concentration gradient or down its concentration gradient. And as I mentioned before, I don't know, I did find there is a paper online. Uh, I talked about those sweet taste receptors. This actually kind of shows you what happens here too. Uh, in the face of the low glucose, you don't have as many of these uh, transporters in the apical membrane. But you can see that they're kind of sitting right underneath the apical membrane, ready to be inserted if there's high glucose levels. So that's what I was talking about before those sweet taste receptors are going to detect the high glucose levels in the lumen of the uh, small intestines and they're going to insert uh, a, a SGLT1, which is the sodium glucose transporter here that I just mentioned. And um, basically it inserts more transporters and you can absorb more glucose as a result. So again, not a great thing if you're uh, like I said, I'm not, uh, Diet Coke triggers these sweet taste receptors, and it does actually promote more glucose absorption if you drink it. So may not be able to lose a lot of weight with Diet Coke. All right, uh, if that's your goal. Um, all right, lipases. Lipases, um, this is actually released in response to CCK. I'm trying to bring home and tie a lot of things together today. Uh, CCK... <laughs> triggers the pancreas to release lipases, and it's the gallbladder that releases bile. So let me just talk about how that works today as well. Bile is a solution of digestive chemicals and liver waste pro uh, products. And this is what it's made of, actually. Bile salts, lecithin, bicarbonate, cholesterol, bile pigments, and trace elements. The main thing that I want you to remember about bile, and I'll come back to the, the previous slide, is that it is an amphipathic molecule. Amphipathic, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So it's produced, bile is produced in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and phospholipids aid in the uptake of these of lipids. These bile salts are amphipathic, they emulsify fats, and basically you, you, we'll be talking about the nucleases in just a minute. This is kind of a more of a broad slide. Okay, so the bile is funneled into the gallbladder and then delivered into the duodenum with stimulation from CCK. And again, this molecule is amphipathic. It means it has two sides to it. It has a nonpolar side and a polar side. So the nonpolar side is actually going to want to closely associate with the fats, whereas the polar side is going to tend to face the aqueous solution. Okay? You don't need to memorize this uh, model. Don't memorize this model. I'm just trying to tell you that this is a very amphipathic molecule. So you can actually see here, again, that nonpolar side is going to want to closely associate with the fat. 
and the polar side is going to closely associate with the aqueous solution. So what this does is it actually, with mechanical stimulation, there's a lot of churning that goes on within the intestines. These, the bile actually immediately associates with these smaller droplets to prevent them from aggregating and becoming big fat globule uh, molecules again. Okay, so the, the way I like to describe it is if you've ever played with oil and vinegar, you know, salad dressing, you might realize when you add the oil to the vinegar, there are two layers, large layers, right? But when you shake them up, right, you can see that just the mechanical stimulation causes the oil to become smaller and smaller into these smaller fat droplets, right? Well, what bile does is it surrounds those smaller fat droplets so they can't re-aggregate. They can't go back to that big fat globule that you had initially when you first added it, okay? So that's what bile does. That's what emulsification is. And when they're in these smaller droplets, those lipases can get in there easier. There's more surface area for the lipase to actually break it down. So here's our emulsion droplet. The bile salts are surrounding it. The lipase actually gets in there and breaks it down to monoglyceride, and fatty acids. Sometimes they re-aggregate a little bit into these micelle kind of formations uh, where you have the fatty acids kind of uh, facing the interior, but eventually they will again be broken down. They, they kind of go back and forth between these formations and breaking down back into monoglycerides and fatty acids. And so the fatty acids and the monoglycerides, remember fat doesn't need any protein to move across the cellular membrane. Because it's hydrophobic, it can just easily, through passive diffusion, enter into the epithelial cells, okay? So um, this is a figure from your textbook. It kind of goes through the process. I'm gonna talk about it though um, in, in the next slide because I think it's a better diagram. But basically what we're doing is we're going from big droplets to small droplets micellar formation, fatty acids, monoglycerides, then it's absorbed into the cell where they're uh, packaged into what's called chylomicrons. And then this is always a test question. I'm going to tell you right now, remember these chylomicrons get delivered into the lymph system. The lacteal system is another word. It goes into the lymph system and it's distributed to adipose tissue where adipose tissue can actually store fat. Okay, so this is a better slide. You can actually see these micelles, uh, but it's the fatty acids that actually uh, diffuse right into the cell. These triacylglycerols form. Okay, so it has a glycerol backbone, bone, triglycerides. And then a protein is added. This is the formation of chylomicrons. And then the chylomicrons are actually delivered into the lymph system. Okay, it's secreted by the Golgi apparatus, by vesicles. So that's how fat is absorbed. All right, now bile is actually recycled. Okay, so these bile salts are taken up by the hepatic portal vein, delivered back into the liver, where it's recycled back into the gallbladder. So 95% of the cholesterol-based bile is recycled. Only about 5% is lost in the feces. And this is just a flow chart, kind of telling you a little bit about um, CCK. We've already gone through that a number of times. If you need um, some text associated with this too, this is a nice chart that summarizes it. The only thing I didn't really talk about is um, the enzymes of ribonucleases and deoxyribonucleases that break down nucleic acids. Okay. All right, so diarrhea. <laughs> All right, so diarrhea actually is interesting. Diarrhea actually is, um, there's different types of diarrhea. You might not have known that. 
Uh, we mentioned this earlier before. There's a secretory type of diarrhea um, when you're talking about cholera. Okay, so individuals that contract cholera, the cholera toxin, uh, get this, the cholera toxin actually turns on adenylocyclase. Remember the GS pathway? Imagine if you turn on adenylocyclase and you never turn it off. All right, so GS pathway is stimulated, cyclic AMP goes up in the cell, it actually activates chloride secretion and it doesn't shut it off. So chloride and bicarbonate are, are transported into the intestines, water follows. And instead of that seven liters that I mentioned earlier before of absorption, you get seven liters of secretion. So that's why cholera is so deadly. Within 24 hours, you can lose your entire bodily fluids. Secretory diarrhea. Osmotic diarrheas are like lactose intolerance. They act as osmolites, pulling fluids in, and that causes diarrhea just because of the osmotic driving forces. Okay. Now, I would argue that malabsorptive and motility related are a type of osmotic diarrhea. Right? With malabsorptive, you don't, because of the inflammation, you're not able to absorb nutrients. They act as osmolites pulling in water. Again, it's a type of osmotic diarrhea. And again, with motility related, if the food is moving too fast through the system, then again, you're not breaking it down and absorbing. They become osmolites pulling water in. And again, that's another type of diarrhea. All right, dysentery is when you have blood, okay, when you have blood in your feces. So it's a diarrhea, but it can also be a, it's basically a term that's used with blood. And that is part of your case study. Um, I think I'm running out of time. Yes? Yes. All right, I got to let you go. We will finish this up on Monday. We're going to start with endocrinology Monday and finish up on Wednesday. So lots to do. Have a great weekend. Um, and I will see you. I'm going to make a few announcements today, too, about that acid-base regulation. Um, but I will put that out this morning. All right. Have a good weekend, y'all. And um, if you need a case study, come on up. I've got a few extras up here. Yeah. Yep, I got it ready. Perfect. Yes. I'm going to go... Yes, thank you, Magna. Um, two Hi, questions. Diana. So, um, chylomicron, yes. it's the liver? Yes. Okay. okay, so it goes to the lymph vessels, and then it's delivered ultimately to adipose tissue. Adipose tissue are cells that uh, uh, basically store that. And a lot of people don't realize this too, but you actually really do need fat in your diets because there are because vitamins that you can't absorb without. Yeah, fat. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so. And then, is this thing, how do you spell the, the two sided bile? Um, amphipathic. It's, um, yep, amphipathic. It's A M P H I P A T H. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, did you have a chance to watch? No. Okay. I'm so sorry. 